All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy, happy Earth Day. Um, so this is the third in our series of calls uh, discussing the strategic plan and the direction we're pointed in coming out of the strategic planning process um, that uh, wrapped up at the early part of this year. So um, I'll let Richard in just a moment get to describing uh, how partnerships are an integral piece of the strategic plan. We do just a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, so we are recording this call so that other people will be able to listen in who maybe um, are out celebrating Earth Day in other ways today. And to preserve the quality of our audio, uh, we're going to go ahead and keep everyone on mute. Um, if you're calling in from a cell phone or a landline, if you could please go ahead and mute yourself as well, since we don't have control of that on this end. Um, and if you are calling or if you are using your computer to join us in the meeting, then you'll see that there's a chat box that you have access to. This is a great place to uh, ask any questions or if you're having um, audio troubles, anything like that, a great place to enter those messages as well. We'll have lots of time at the end of the call today for questions, um, and those will also be entered using the chat function there. So you can enter them during the call or when we get to the Q&A portion. Uh, if you're having trouble using that chat function, you can also send your questions to um, the chapters at slowfoodusa.org email address, and we'll be monitoring that during the call as well. Um, all right, so I, I think that is everything for now. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and then Richard, let you take it from there. Thank you, Megan. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I am thrilled to see so many names on the uh, the call-in docket on a Friday afternoon, um, a Friday afternoon during a time of year that we know is extremely busy with so many other competing uh, com competing commitment. So thank you. Thank you for being on the call. Um, I hope you can see, if you are not calling in but you're looking at a screen, you can see the agenda that we um, will tackle during this hour. Um, I have to say I'm excited that we're at this point in the strategic direction. I mean, past strategic planning, um, we are now actually rather furiously, yet quietly, plowing away at the actual Ford motion that we had described back in January, and um, this meeting is queued up to be the one where we begin to look at those three areas that we're working on and really moving our organization into this direction. Um, we're able to tackle the very issue that, of course, I think we're all very familiar in, in, in actually doing at the local level, the national, the global, is that of partnerships. I, hold on. Um, there we go. Um, so what we're going to discuss today is partnerships in our new strategic direction. Uh, as we know um, by now, hopefully I'm beginning to recite it like, a, a, like a, a mantra, is that our, you know, we have simplified and, and identified at the core, the verb in our strategic mission is to inspire individuals and communities to change the world um, through food that is good, clean, and fair for all. We identified three areas of work where we hope the outcome of this work will inspire people to see the world differently, to begin to shift the culture and make the behavioral shifts because of these three strategic, strategic actions. Um, campaigns, gatherings, and, and I can just as an aside say that on the campaign work, we are um, excited that we will soon have a new campaign and communications director. We're conducting some really interesting research evaluating um, the behavior and demographics and types of supporters who are driven towards certain kinds of activities. Um, on the gatherings, we are also conducting some analysis to see the when and the where, and we cannot wait soon to announce what the large gathering will be. Um, we also know that many of us are all eyes and ears on Terra Madre because that is just around the corner as a major gathering. But meanwhile, partnering is something that we have always done. In fact, you may think about the number of times you may have mentioned, oh yeah, we at Slow Food fill in the blank partner with. So-and-so is a longtime partner of Slow Foods. Um, this is something that I know that we do. I think we do it really well, 
and yet it is informal, it is at times unclear what the partnerships are, and we almost look at it as this thing we do, but it's not, as I, as I hope, what will begin to become clear, an intentional part of our work so that we can accomplish our, our goal to inspire individuals and communities. And by intentionally making this as a chunk of work that, um, that we do, and we do with very discrete purposes and outcomes, um, is, I think, something of, of a shift. And what I wanted to share with you is, you know, some of the things that, again, I know we all know this because this should resonate with what we already do, is why we partner. Partnerships can be um, awkward. They can be messy. Uh, it can be very unclear as to who's getting what out of the partnership. But it is one of, hopefully, mutual benefit. Um, it can often be uneven partnership, especially when a small organization. I do hear some noises. Uh, someone may need to mute. If, if you're on a phone, um, I hear zipping, maybe it's chopping, but, but uh, if you can mute, that would be great. Um, thanks. Uh, in terms of why we partner, you know, whether it's organizations that are of equal weight and intensity, sometimes that partnership is so easy you don't even have to think about it. When it's a partnership of like an ocean liner partnering with a tugboat, that uneven nature of it make, can make the expectations and the return on investment, all those sorts of things, very unclear. So when it comes to why we partner, and we think about why we at Slow Food partner with other organizations, um, I mean, we want to build solidarity. We want to bring their knowledge into our work because we don't have it all figured out. And we, we hope that bringing other organizations in will build the intellectual capital and, and the know-how inside our network. Um, we know that we want to probably access their network and their resources. Um, and we know that very often you are probably approached, like we are approached, of you know, incredibly innovative, passionate people and organizations who want a resource want our resources and to want to access our network. Um, I think as an organization that is something of the incubator of many other organizations, by partnering we can remain relevant. We can learn from others um, and, 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 and enter into new conversations and, and, and of course share our insight into these new conversations, reaching these new audiences. And, and I think also, when we think especially of the relationship between events, the, the role of gathering and partnering, is when we invite others into our world of work or our events, it is acknowledging that they may have expertise, specialization that we do not possess. And, and I think we should be freed up by it. So I think partnering should free us up from having to feel that we need to know everything and everything about everything. There, we, we can begin to acknowledge that others may be able to handle some pieces of the work because the large cultural shift transforming our food system is more than what we can handle alone. In terms of the things that make us a good partner, and us meaning slow food as a good partner, I think without question we bring pleasure with us. Um, we bring a sense of fun and love for food that is often missing, especially for a lot of organizations that have found their strategic niche to be addressing a rather unhappy piece of the food system. Um, I know that for those who work on, you know, whether it's labor issues, animal welfare issues, whatever that piece is, it may be the most distressing, depressing, like we're never going to win um, piece of the work. And if we can bring into a partnership the sense of joy and zaniness and fun and love that, of course, people expect slow food to bring. I, I do think that reminding that pleasure is a, a critical piece is one of the things that they hope we will bring, and I think that we do bring. Um, I think that we do bring visibility, um, their visibility to our community. Um, hopefully, it is an authentic, honest partnership where we provide honest feedback. Um, I think the level of trust can be measured by how long of a partnership, um, where there's more time to build clear communications, 
um, to be reliable in that partnership. Um, and, and I think as we know, especially for those of us who've been in food for a long time, gosh, just showing up, the fact that we are there acknowledging that someone else's work is of value um, is extremely important. Um, so, I mean, I think showing up is, is, is something that forever people are looking like, gosh, why wasn't the red snail there? We thought that slow food would have been there. In terms of the types of partners, and, and this is where some of the language is intentional and, and where there can be confusion and you look on a number of different organizational websites and you're like, oh, I see this organization doesn't have partners, they only have sponsors or their sponsors are partners. Um, I think when we look at the types of partners we have, there are fiscal partnerships. It is an engaged long-term or short-term, but a formal relationship where there is a flow of resources, a flow of money. Um, those sort of fiscal sponsors are the types of partners where we may learn we may learn as much as we also receive funds or we may give funds. Um, some of the partnerships are, are time delimited, you know, whether it's an event sponsor or a campaign sponsor where we adjoin over one particular project or moment and then we come up and then we fall apart. Um, we certainly have a history of partnerships that have come and gone and Certainly the short-term ones can, in some ways, be the cleanest. Um, in terms of the types of partners, the civil society partners. I mean, I, I do think that when we often think of our elevator pitch of who we are, we are part of civil society and, and we want to partner with others in civil society who may not be food, but have a, uh, an overlapping interest with us. Um, an area where we know that we are often weak is, you know, partnering with other organizations that have some technical expertise that we do not. Um, and, and some of those, you know, may mean that we don't have to have all of the same values in all of the places. Um, and then I think something that um, Megan will talk about toward, towards the end of the call is, is really thinking about the, the slow food family as, as family. I mean, loose, but we're all related. And, and thinking about the kinds of efforts and organization, organizational pushes, campaigns, events that come into our world, um, sometimes you know, at short notice, um, we think of you know, Slow Wine or um, Slow Food International as partners. I mean, we're related, so it's like internal partners or internal customers, but it's not customers, it's partners. Um, but they're inside our family. And, and I think this is a different piece of the, the typology of partners. Now, in terms of how fast will we begin to move in this direction of thinking about our network, you all as partners, of uh, other organizations identifying who are our partners that we are locked in with on work, whether it's thematically or whether it's around an event. Um, we have to recognize some of this will, will happen in, in a gradual process, there are some, you know, very clear deadlines for completion of activity, um, and and maybe these 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 two um, timelines are, are, are worth just me spending a moment on. One is is beginning to refine some of the language. I was just sharing with you about the criteria for selecting strategic partnerships. I think that as we move towards a network that is looser. Um, lighter, with, with, with light, more lighter social ties rather than just the sort of strong social ties that you and we have invested in in, in our network of chapters, is that um, we may see great opportunity for lots of new kinds of partners that we haven't identified before. Um, so we are refining and you know, reviewing the kind of language to begin to describe that kind of um, uh, engagement of, of key partners, certainly around campaigns, certainly around events that will give the national office some very clear, you know, places with which whom we work with. And then, you know, I, I think something that we hadn't thought of before and, and haven't described before, except I talked about it a few moments ago, is thinking about within the Slow Food family. Our partnership with Slow Food International, the mothership, is one that is undergoing a renovation like we are. 
Uh, and in fact, I think in many ways what we are learning here is beginning to inform how Slow Food International manages its incredibly complex relationships and, and begin to think of its partnership with um, national associations, nas international campaigns, what is our obligation, how can we better fine-tune what that looks like. And um, what we have been working with Slow Food International on is, is the idea of launching an international communications and fundraising campaign in the fall after Terra Madre around um, our global commitment to biodiversity. And um, I think, again, this may also be informed by what we'll be launching next month with our um, 100 years of plenty, um, our end of fiscal year fundraising campaign and communications campaign around um, biodiversity and the arc of taste. I think we'll begin to see that we're in lock a little bit more closely than we have been. and. Um, and, and so I think this idea of looking at the partnership with SFI is something that is taking time to really think through how to renegotiate what are the expectations so that we can be a good partner with them. Now, since, you know, this is hopefully space that does not sound new or untested, this is based on um, our, our past successes. And our past successes of working in partnerships is informing how we move forward. Um, I'd love to turn to um, our colleague, Andy Nowak, who um, is not sitting in my office here, but is in Denver. And I think Andy is on this call and can, can be unmuted and can maybe just, you know, rather than me just talking at sort of 30,000 feet, what does this look like when you're on the ground in gardens and especially having just completed a national um, training of the trainers gathering in North Carolina? It alone and the work of the Slow Gardens has opened up the door for so many interesting partnerships that th that place had not existed before. So with that, I'll go to mute. And, um, hey, and hey, Richard, Andy here. Thank you to Andy. Great, Andy. Nice to hear you. All right. Good. Um, so well, um, take it away. Yeah, thank you. So um, afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from Denver. Um, with the Slow Gardens program, um, our goal has been to partner with Slow Food chapters in school garden programs around the country to provide resources, technical assistance, and expertise for school gardens the Slow Food way. And so we formed this program a couple years ago, and through the, the last couple years, we have um, formed many partnerships with groups that are also supporting gardens, but may have different um, strengths and um, different assets than, than we bring to the school gardens. And, and so these partnerships uh, make a lot of sense for us to extend our reach into the school garden community. Um, I call these program partnerships because they are specifically designed around the, the school garden programs and, and food education for kids. And I want to give you three examples that fit nicely into Richard's categories that he showed a couple slides ago about different kinds of partnerships. Um, as most of you know, um, we are receiving financial support from Chipotle, and so they are obviously a fiscal sponsor and partner um, with us on school gardens. We have very like-minded missions um, around food education and, and, and school gardens, and we, we provide them the connection to school gardens, and they provide us in, in exchange um, very generous support that supports this office here in Denver and our ability to engage with chapters and gardens around the country. Um, we are, will soon be launching a very large social media campaign with Chipotle. Um, we should see that the first week in May. And this also will put Slow Food in front of thousands and thousands of followers of Chipotle, introducing us to a new audience and getting, us, uh, getting our work and, and our efforts out in front of a, a whole new class of, of uh, potential slow food supporters and, and activists. So we're very excited about that campaign. Another partnership that we are very proud of is with Food Corps. The, the uh, leadership of Food Corps came from Slow Food um, now five, six years ago. Um, and now they have over 205 service members across 18 states in, in, in the country that are on the ground specifically working on school gardens and food education with kids. 
we have made each of those service members a member of Slow Food, and we have shared our resources, um, including the Chipotle resources, with the this, um, Food Corps service members as they engage in uh, typically one to three schools each. So we, you know, that extends our reach into probably over five, six hundred schools across the country. Um, really, the, the relationship with Food Corp gives us more boots on the ground um, as they have these very active service members. The third partnership that we're very proud of is with the Edible Schoolyard. Um, the Edible Schoolyard, obviously with its roots in, with Alice Waters, uh, another huge supporter of Slow Food, has an excellent website um, that has become quickly becoming a, a very fantastic depository for everything around school gardens. So we have shared our resources with the Edible Schoolyard Project. They have posted them on their website. Many of our chapters and school garden programs have created um, their pages on the Edible Schoolyard Project. And this puts us in front of another 4,000 potential school gardens um, and, and really using a website that we don't have the ability to do right now. And so we're very excited to share our resources with the Edible Schoolyard. So there's my three quick uh, examples of program partnerships. I can assure you that with my co-director Lauren Howe that we we can go on for an hour talking about all the partnerships that we've created around school gardens. We feel that uh, the Slow Food Program is in a very good place right now for partnerships. We welcome any ideas about partnerships from from your community and we're here to help you build partnerships in your community so that your programs uh, and, and support in the community beca can become stronger. With that, I'll wait for questions, I think, later at the end, and I'll turn this back to Megan, I believe. Great. Thanks so much, Andy. That was a really, really nice overview of some of the, um, the really incredible work the National School Garden Program has been able to do through various partnerships. Uh, so one of the other activities over the last couple of years that has really informed um, both the planning process that highlighted partnerships is a key piece of the work that we've done and that we want to uh, really intentionally focus on as, as part of our focus moving forward um, uh, was the, the Slow Meat event and campaign. So I'm going to give just some quick examples of, again, some of the types of partners uh, that we have found really valuable in our work. So um, one that we mentioned was like a, a civil society partner, what it makes sense to me to think about as a thought partner, someone who stretches our, um, our ability to approach a subject with, with nuance and with uh, critical information and also helps us to reach these new audiences. So some of those key partners in Slow Meat um, were the Humane Society of the U.S., uh, this was a very unique partner to bring into a space talking about meat and meat consumption, making sure that we were addressing it in a complicated and, um, and challenging way and really putting us at the forefront of the conversation about where do animal rights, uh, the, the interests of animal rights groups link into the interests of eaters and the interests of ranchers and how can we um, find points of intervention that serve the needs of all of those groups and that are carefully thought through. Um, so that was a really important space uh, for us to be in and an important, an important uh, collaborator to have along with us. Um, another one that I would point to would be uh, Farm Aid, again, reaching an audience that is a little bit different than ours, but also helping us to bring the voice in of, um, of some of the industrial farmers like Craig Watts and what they can uh, add to and help us to grow this, this slow meat movement. <clears throat> Now, there are other types of partners as well. So partners that uh, can use, support you through fiscal resources um, and that also serve in this, this role of uh, helping to expand the reach and helping to bring new audiences into the slow, mo slow food movement itself. Um, one of the really key partners that we had on Slow Meat was the Christensen Fund. They were able to help us identify and sponsor indigenous um, par participants from several, uh, several countries outside of the U.S., so thanks to their help, we were able to bring folks from Papua New Guinea, um, uh, people from, uh, from Mexico, from indigenous groups in Mexico, and also uh, some of the indigenous peoples from the US and the Navajo Nation. So I believe someone might be calling and using their phone. Uh, and if I could just remind everyone to take a moment and make sure you're muted to uh, help, help make sure this recording is nice and clean for those who will be listening to it later. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, local partners that we can work with as well. So one of the most successful pieces of this Slow Meat event 
was uh, the tours that happened leading up to the event, getting people acquainted with the place that this was actually happening with the surroundings of Denver. Um, one of Slow Food's great strengths, of course, is thinking about the food system as a very place-based activity, something that speaks to the local culture. So we were very lucky to work with the Colorado Board of Tourism and the Colorado Brewers Guild, both to find the um, local knowledge that was happening there uh, and to help support the event um, from a financial standpoint as well. So these are lessons that we'll take with us as we go into this gathering work and as we think strategically and carefully about which kind of partners we're, we're going to be engaging with. Um, another key set of partners in the Slow Meat event was uh, what we were talking about before is our Slow Food family. So these are other national associations like uh, Slow Food Canada, um, like Slow Food uh, Slow Food Italy and Slow Food International, Slow Food Germany. Many of these groups helped to bring people to the Slow Meat event itself. Uh, we had um, around 230 delegates coming from over 13 countries. And a large part of um, that international collaboration came from very concerted partnerships within the Slow Food Network itself, working with Slow Food South Africa, folks like this. Uh, and this is a space where we have to spend some time and we have to cultivate this, this relationship. Um, and it doesn't just happen internationally. We also had great support from uh, local slow food chapters who identified and sent delegates to help make this gathering more complex, more interesting, and ultimately more impactful. And the result of that was uh, Slow Meat being adopted as an international campaign. So there is this kind of um, movement that happens with our partnerships that both brings people into the slow food movement and then also uh, sends the inspiration out into the broader community by, by bringing in these, these unique partners. Um, so I think that that's that's uh, that that's as much as I really want to um, linger on slow meat for right now because I'm sure that there are some questions uh, and I want to make sure we have lots of time for Q and A. I'd like to start though by um, kind of kicking this back to the participants who are on the call. I know a lot of you currently work with local chapters, and I'd love to hear some of the local partnerships um, that you might have pioneered and some of the results and lessons that you would have from that. So if anyone has a, a partnership they'd like to share, if you could just um, raise your hand by typing in the, the message box there and letting me know that you would like to share some of your local partnerships. Um, in the meantime, we can answer some questions. So let's see, I have a question coming in from um, John, Ka Ka oh, sorry. John Casaza. Uh, and he asks, does Slow Food USA have a list of partners that are already networking on a national, state, or local level? Um, and I, I'll go ahead and answer that for you, John. So we don't have a published list of this. And part of this is because, as many of you will know from doing community organizing type work, um, Partnerships are very fluid. They grow organically. They take a long time to develop. We really, you know, in thinking about the things that make slow food partnerships unique, we're quite proud of the fact that we take a long time to build the relationships between our partners. Um, so this is not something that we necessarily have documented. Uh, we do try to keep track of contacts. There's a certain internal um, knowledge to it. We have some sponsorship type partners that are acknowledged on the website either for specific events or as small business supporters. But uh, we don't keep a comprehensive list and I think it would be pretty prohibitive to try to do so considering how, how fluid these relationships can be. So I hope, I hope that helped to answer your question, John. Um, and now I am actually going to ask Emily Bell to tell us a little bit about a partnership she has recently been working on with her, her local chapter. So Emily, let's see, I don't have the power to unmute you here. Hi, Megan. I'm, yes, I'm on the screen and on the phone. Can you cool. hear me? Yes, yeah, so we can hear you great. Great. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, as the new leader of the Philadelphia chapter, I was concerned about consistency and fairness in granting the snail of approval locally. And Villanova University, which is local for us, has as part of their MBA program, a class in which they essentially do a, a management consulting project for a local nonprofit. So they approached us and we were very lucky to connect with a group of students that was not only talented but genuinely interested in, in the slow food values. And we worked with them to create a scorecard, or I should say we're still working with them because the scorecard has a few pieces that need to be completed, but we're working with them to complete a scorecard that is kind of based on the LEED certification for green building, but 
rather than using aspects of um, sustainable building, used criteria that we came up with during our brainstorming session that tied back to the pillars of good, clean, and fair food. So we'd be happy to share that with any chapters who are interested once it's completed. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing that, Emily. And I, you know, I got a chance to um, to take a quick peek at this tool, and it really, it really is an incredible tool. And I think highlights um, how this sort of constellation of partnerships can all work together. So uh, that this local partnership can now help um, to spread some knowledge out to the other chapters. And thinking this way of, you know, all of the all of uh, the different pieces of the Slow Food Network and the Slow Food Family working in partnership with each other. Um, it's really inspiring and exciting. So Emily and I will be be uh, also doing a little bit of, of brainstorming for how to help get this tool out to all of you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks again, Emily. And if anyone has any questions for her, please uh, go ahead and, and pop that into the chat box there. Um, yeah, so let's see. L Loretta uh, Sapanen asks uh, to have the scorecard uh, shared with her local group. And, and um, as Emily mentioned, I think that will definitely be something that, that will be happening once it's uh, ready, ready for public consumption. Great. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, okay, so let's see. We have a couple more examples of partnerships we'll get to. I'm going to answer a really quick question from Bob uh, Gligoria, who wants to know if Slow Food USA still has a partnership with the Meyer Corporation, who uh, produces Analon, Circulon, and other kitchen appliances. Uh, and I am happy to tell you, Bob, we've, we've uh, just been back in touch with that partner and are exploring ways of making resources available um, to the network through that partnership. So uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled to the Leader Links email and the uh, Slow Food Leaders Facebook group, and you'll be hearing more about that in coming months, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to hand this over to Charity Kenyon for a moment, who has... Uh, has some great examples from Slow Food California as well as uh, Slow Food Sacramento. So Charity, your mic should be live if you'd like to share a few of those with us. All right, thank you. Yes, well, we do partner uh, with in Slow Food California and our policy committee with roughly 20, maybe more organizations that are working in the good, clean, and fair food and farm policy arena. And we, uh, we have co-sponsored legislation with them, with these partners. We testify in support of their bills. We get them to testify in support of our bills. Uh, we, we support letters. We share information and we meet regularly either by phone, sometimes in person in Sacramento. And that has really helped spread our reach and, and also identifies us to other organizations as working in a space where our grassroots and our ability to pinpoint um, districts where we might have a member of the Ag Committee or the Health Committee uh, that we want to address with respect to a bill that we're needing to get out of a committee. Uh, we, can, we can go right to the chapter and say, call your representative and tell them that you support this, uh, this piece of legislation. So from our um, experience, people are really appreciative of our grassroots network, and I think that ought to be added to one of the uh, one of the characteristics of Slow Food Partnerships that's appreciated by the people we work with. And then another example is Slow Food California partnered with Slow Food Mexico to create a travel opportunity and we visited lots of small farms growing um, Arc of Taste and, um, and culturally appropriate uh, foods in small communities where the tourist uh, bureaus are not going to be sending you. It was a fantastic trip, but we also used it as a mechanism to raise money to help support those projects in Mexico and also to support uh, Slow Food California. So those are two areas of partnerships that work very well for us here in California. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Charity. And I think those are, are great examples of that kind of thought leadership type of partner and also looking within the Slow Food family to find really powerful partners to help uh, make this inspiration and cultural shift that we're, we're all shooting for, right? Um, I have a quick question from Zeno about uh, what kind of partners, um, what kind of partners are engaged with the Arc of Taste work. So um, I'll give a few examples of who we've worked with through the, the program at a national level. 
and also some of the spaces I've seen for real success um, in more local partnering among among uh, individuals, people in the Arc of Taste Committee, and also uh, chapter chapter models. So. Um, we have worked with a lot of different uh, partners who focus very specifically on biodiversity and agricultural biodiversity. Um, one of our longstanding partners, of course, is Seed Savers Exchange, and uh, we've been really happy to see um, a growing collaboration uh, around the National School Garden Program and Seed Savers Exchange and the Arc of Taste. This kind of holistic project is really what... Um, uh, what we feel like is, is, you know, sort of definitive of where slow food offers interesting value. So they're working together to bring seeds uh, into school gardens across the country. Uh, and then the students are working on doing the research and nomination of those seeds to the Arc of Taste, while Seed Savers Exchange is providing some of that um, base research and also contact with the people who have been stewarding those seeds uh, over the past, the past years and have helped to save them. So that's a really cool one. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of the partnering that happens around the Arc of Taste happens with our regional committees and with local chapters, uh, folks doing Arc of Taste dinners, um, people doing uh, grow outs of certain seeds. So seed banks are always an excellent partner for that kind of work. Um, but there, there are lots, universities, high schools. Um, it's a pretty, pretty mobile space for, for partnerships. So those would be just some of the examples that I can think of. Um, oh, thank you, Charity. Reminds me also, the Livestock Conservancy has been a very key partner in that, that research also. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for helping to highlight that. Um, so I think that that looks like uh, I'm not getting a ton of requests for sharing out other local partnerships, but of course, we're always interested. Uh, if you're doing something really cool and want to send us a little write-up to the chapters at slowfoodusa.org email, um, we're always looking for, for cool local work to highlight in our leader links emails as well. <clears throat> So are there any, any further questions about partnership generally, or uh, this would be a great time if you have questions about something we didn't touch on this call. Also, you'd be welcome to, to ask any questions you've got while we've got each other on the line. Hmm. Ah. Uh, Zeno asks how slow fish fits in. Um, and I think that's a fair question. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Richard take it. <laughs> uh, I think slow fish is a great example of our evolving network, and one that is bringing us in direct uh, partnership with organizations like Marine Stewardship Alliance and. Um, the fisheries extension agents and many organizations that we may not be um, necessarily finding a place to align with, except maybe at a particular um, in a particular region where there may be a history or some logical organizational um, arrangement. Um, I, I think back to when we were announcing Slow Meat, gosh, over two years ago. Our hope is that Slow Meat. Um, recognizing that meat was a critical organizing principle, that it would inspire slow fish and slow cheese and um, slow grain and slow beer and slow wine, and that there would be other ways thematically to organize our, our communities because not only would it provide a different connection and hookup between us at the national office to partner with you um, in actual communities, um, but that it would also open up the door for bringing in other organizations that we often don't know, you know, where can they connect with us, where can we connect with them, where do we add value to each other's work. And so Slow Fish was led by a, uh, you know, a, as you know, a, a national community of interest within Slow Food with some of these other partners. Um, who reached out to, and, and I have to say we're very grateful for some of the leadership that was provided, not only by Slow Food International and, and the Slow Fish Project, but Slow Food Canada, who devoted a great deal of sort of guidance as to how did they find this issue garnering a um, ongoing work um, across geography. So it wasn't just Eastern Canada or Western Canada, but that there, there was a Canadian slow fish conversation. So this effort 
took on so much momentum that there was a decision to stage an event in New Orleans, and I, all accounts, I think we will have a, a you know a full full report on, you know how it met the expectations of the organizers, but it, it does remind me so much of uh, the Westward Slow gathering over a decade ago in Denver, which was a precursor to Slow Meet. And, and I think that it has opened up a space for uh, actual wild harvesters who so rarely get to get together and actually feel good about what they're doing, despite all the challenges of overfishing, overregulation, whatever the over issue is. Um, so rarely do they get to come together and actually share in the passion and love for food and what their role in food is. And I think it's a really, a, you know, a, a place and a lightness with which the slow fish um, community within slow food was able to produce a gathering with partners that added value to the fisheries community, one that wherever they are, whether it's, you know, Gulf Coast or East Coast fisheries, what the fishing families always describe is they feel that they are under siege, they are under threat, they have no allies. And I think the level and the lightness and the love for food and pleasure is where, in our partnership, added value to a group of fishermen who are looking for allies. Um, so I'd say that this is one of these internal and external partnerships that will continue to grow. Um, Will there be another slow fish gathering? Well, we know at Terra Madre there will be a robust slow fish meeting as there was two years ago, but since then we've had the first slow fish gathering of any sort of scale outside of Italy. This will certainly inspire other slow fish activity. I also hope that it'll inspire a, um, a move towards the gathering in Denver next year is not just slow meat, but it is a slow food nation, and that the slow fish nation will rally and careen towards this gathering so that there are communications between fish advocates in this, in this instance, in and between chapters, in and between other organizations, so that we can begin to share the manner in which how we gather is one of the keys that we bring as partners. Um, so maybe that, that's plenty. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Zeno. I think I think it's really well put. And Charity points out a really great point too that that's also a really nice example of partnering within the slow food family. So that multiple um, leaders from different parts of the network, be they they chapter leaders or um, or working in other other spaces with policy or with slow fish, the slow fish community came together to make that happen in collaboration with each other. So I think that's a really good point. If I, you mentioned charity, and if there's one thing that I, I didn't want to lose track of, that charity, am I on? Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. You look so alarmed. Um, uh, that uh, the charity raised that I don't want to lose this point. I know that when we think of the hat that we wear, it is that of you know, the perpetually struggling, crazy business model, nonprofit organization that, you know, fights for our place under the sun. And undoubtedly, that is a hat we wear and one that puts us into partnerships with different entities where we may think of ourselves as that. But when we look at the chapter reports, one of the most incredible things that we do so well, which means you do so well, is in communities, um, you are staging gatherings that bring in unlikely people together. And in these gatherings, they are very often leveraged as fundraising um, activities. And these funds are then invested in cultivating leaders, um, seed money for new crazy projects that are today's crazy but tomorrow's obvious next step. Slow food plays a role as innovative grassroots philanthropists. So when we look at the category of the types of partners we are, for some organizations and individuals and like, you know, leaders who are so out, out in front that they have no support behind them, when we recognize them, when we direct resources to them, we're 
philanthropy. And I know that we don't think of ourselves as that because philanthropy is resources, monetary, as well as the time and the passion and the intellectual capital we share. But this thing that we find when we look at the chapter reports, the audit of, of what chapters do, this is almost universally um, a truism across our network. And it's not something that we, of course, are running workshops training you how to raise funds to, you know, and, and what to do with those funds and how to make those decisions. Um, I mean, I, I think that we are so thrilled that the fiscal umbrella allows that to be philanthropic work, and that is one of the advantage of us, advantages of us operating as a national entity. But the actual um, partnering you do on the ground is philanthropy, and it's, it's something that we, we often forget or overlook because we don't think of ourselves as that. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Kim Worst from Chicago for a moment, because this is something that that chapter has been thinking a lot about, and they've been working on a tool to help them uh, help them be strategic in their partnering. So Kim, you are unmuted, uh, and I think we should be able to hear you now. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay. So our chapter, uh, one thing that we're struggling with in Chicago is just the vast diversity of community organizations that are food and non and just wanting to make sure that our impact and limited time and resources is as valuable as it can be and as applicable to their mission as possible. So one thing we're trying to work on is creating a community needs and resources survey that we can you know, send out into our networks and sort of do like a little give a hundred dollar gift card, everyone that fills it out gets you know, entered into a gift card for a restaurant that's an arctic taste restaurant here in Chicago. And then we can sort of see what sort of programming is most important for them. Is it us going in and doing a tabling? Is it us teaching a canning class? Is it a fiscal or a just a communications and promoting their event partnership? Uh, and then also, you know, what resources they have. Do they have money? Do they have a location? Do they have people? Uh, and through, once we start getting that data back, we'll be able to be able to reissuing this survey, hopefully, in perpetuity to really assess um, the community around here and dictate our programming to be helpful. So we're still working on that. It would be great if anyone else had resources to add to that. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now in Chicago. That sounds like really, really interesting and cool work, and I uh, appreciate the um, kind of long-term thinking that it takes to uh, recognize the need for that and to to build that out. Can you can you give us uh, just like a glimpse, Kim, of what um, what kind of questions you guys will be asking in this, or what kind of groups you're hoping to be able to be more effective in working with? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it is not necessarily food groups, but maybe um, food pantries or. Uh, let's say people that are doing fair wage uh, initiatives here in Chicago or even just community garden people. Um, some of the questions we're asking is one, like, you know, what kind of organization are you? Are you a food nonprofit? Are you a restaurant food service? Do you serve an underserved population? Are you an advocacy organization, a human rights organization? Are you a cultural heritage organization, an NGO? Are you private sector? Are you a farmer or producer? So that's kind of how we start it, a lot of just demographic information. And then we go into asking, um, have you partnered with us before in the last five years, and give us a quick summary of what that looked like to you. And then we ask, you know, what would be most useful for you? Is it like a food preparation cooking instruction? Is it community meal preparation where we come in and cook a meal? Is it an educational lecture, a book club, uh, having us actually come in and partner with you to do a blog? or other posts, um, and then other promotional things that we can do, and then actually asking what skills do your staff members have that can also contribute to the, the partnership, and what facilities might you have, do you have a building, do you have a meeting room, do you have equipment, transport, that kind of thing. So a lot of it's just kind of nuts and bolts, which are questions we'd be asking anyway, and we can kind of see if there's common answers, um, and we as the, and the board can go, oh, you know, this this question seems to be coming up a lot, this answer, and we can then, on our budgeting, adapt for the next year. So it's also little things like what's the best time of day, what's the best day of week, what season is most helpful, 
So when we're planning our calendar for the next year, we know to reserve maybe and make sure that we have more resources for a specific date and time. There's a little bit more than that, but I don't know how much you want me to go into it. No, I think that's, that's a great interview. That's or, sorry, overview. Um, uh, I mean, it sounds like such a cool and exciting project. So I'd love let's let's keep tabs on that and make sure that we also um, you know like the like the snail of a, approval uh, scorecard. Find a way to make make that available to uh, all of our all of our slow food family partners that people can take that inspiration that you guys have and work with it because I think it's again a really great example of um, of finding solutions on the ground that are very appropriate to the scale at which at which the chapter is working and helps to tailor the kind of work you're doing um, and draws on the kind of knowledge that really uh, you know only only local experts like yourselves really have that knowledge so um, I think it's really cool. I'll definitely be be following up and checking in with you on that. Um, any any other questions out there that we can that we can address right now? All right. Well, I, I think we have we have one question from Zeno that might be a nice um, kind of summary and wrap up for our discussion of partnerships today which is to think a bit about how um, gatherings, campaigns, and partners all interact with each other. Um, so I, could I, I'm going to put Richard on the spot. And <laughs> so Richard will be giving a, a little summary of this, uh, of this discussion that we've had today by looking at the interaction of those three pieces of our strategic direction, gathering campaigns and partners. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad, Zena, that you we're able to actually bring home the reasons why we landed on these three areas of campaigns, gatherings, and partners. Because our partnerships, of course, are critical not only to support the gatherings and campaigns, but I think what we came to really realize, and, and it's why, coming back to that, the, the, the word I used, intentional, these are intentional activities that matter unto themselves. Because only through, you know, what is maybe an authentic partnership. Authentic partnerships come out of trust, and some of that trust can be built over long periods of time. And I, I think Ch Charity remarked on the Livestock Conservancy and Chefs Collaborative and Seed Savers was a long-standing partnership for biodiversity. And we were able to muddle through and hopefully figure out where are the handoffs, how does that relationship um, make sense. In events, when they're recurring, there's an opportunity for that long-standing partnership and trust to be built. Um, but very often, gatherings, the, these events, these gatherings occur, and they're a very finite period of time. They come, and then they go, and, and we look for partnerships that are at the right scale, the right scale to be a national partner, the right scale to be a local partner. And we will certainly be looking for some interesting um, and, and, and strategic partnerships to, to stage our national gathering in Denver next year. And some of those will be logical and from that geographic region. Some of them may be partners that are um, like organizations. I think of Slow Money. I think of Farmer's Market organizations, some of the other national entities that may want to join forces with us so that the slow going has many, many, many elements. Similarly, with campaigns, you know, with campaigns, we are looking for discrete interventions that individuals and communities can take to begin to make emblematic and real, realistic and, and substantive shifts in our culture towards good, clean, and fair. With these, I think there's opportunities to partner with other en entities that have mailing lists that we want to access, members and issues that we want to access. Um, there may be interesting opportunities for cause marketing, something that we have not really done very much of. I, I don't know how well equipped we are. To, to join forces with some of those entities. I mean, the partnerships around campaigns that we think of are organizations that, that, that share the same space and commitment to issues, but may have a different demographic base. Um, where the campaigns careen towards gatherings, well, then we may be able to build some, some more longstanding relationships. Um, 
but I, I think certainly when I we think of slow money, which was one I know, I know that you had um, had remarked on, um, they too, oddly enough, are in Colorado. They too are organizing and planning an event. Um, whether we will join forces or whether um, we will simply share some of the um, intelligence to stage gatherings of, of the scale that we're talking about. We are certainly looking at gatherings that are more outward facing, more public facing. Um, therefore, when it comes to the partnerships that we're going to be turning to, what partners are there that can help us reach new audiences, much as what um, Andy had described with um, uh, the partnership with Chipotle. My God, their social media reach. We're going to encounter people who've never heard of us, and how can we take them on this journey to begin to make changes in their individual lives, their community, their national, and their global lives? Um, this is where we think this opportunity can um, can, can grow our movement. Um, I know that we're approaching the hour, and um, I wanted to make sure that um, uh, you know we continue to stay connected as. We, in the up upcoming weeks in particular, and then months, um, really begin to move from uh, the kind of where does theory hit practice and hit the road, we will actually begin to make some tracks and begin to share with you and, and, and seek out guidance and feedback on, on key issues. Certainly, we are finding increasingly um, leader links, for one. Um, you may have noticed there is a... Um, um, sort of a takeover when you visit the leader pages of our site, which encourages, encourages you to subscribe to leader links. If there are folks who you think would benefit from the information that is in this awesome monthly resource, um, encourage people to subscribe. We're finding that more and more former leaders, uh, leaders who are now also partnering with other organizations are beginning to, to, to subscribe to it. Um, that excites us because it means we're beginning to build you know, more of a conversation. I think that compared to our conversation back in January, um, this felt like we have now more space to begin to share together as partners where we're going, where we're taking our, our national community. And then I would also say, you know, encourage you to um, connect with the um, leader's Facebook page. Um, it is so much quicker and easier for you to upload, like, here's something we just learned, check this out in a timely fashion, just as we find it really useful. Um, not that we endorse one social media platform over the other, but it does seem to, to, to lend itself to some of that quick communication. Um, I do know that we will have, um, you know, exciting announcements with staff and events and Terra Madre fun to be able to announce in the upcoming week. So please stay tuned in those channels. And when we are ready to stage a the next call in which there is, you know, useful things to share, whether it's some of the findings or some of the decisions, um, please be on the lookout for that as well. And in the meantime, I don't know if I should turn it over to you, Megan. Um, I just want to thank you all for giving us a Friday afternoon, so many of you, um, and for sharing your stories, um, because I, I think that especially on this issue of um, success that we've had in establishing partners, um, there is so much peer-to-peer -peer learning that we can be doing here that you can you can teach us. I mean, I was hoping, Peter, you would talk about the relationship um, that has been so fruitful with the lexicon. Um, I know that we have shared that through national communications, but these are the sort of things that are appropriately scaled and you all are running with. And um, sharing this among all of us, I think, will help to um, to you know to really see that grow, whether it's film screenings or or cookware, we're working on it, and we know you are too. And you may have ideas that can bubble up to a national partnership. So we encourage you to share those ideas as well. So with that, have a wonderful weekend. We hope that Earth Day has meaning for you, and if not, that Passover does, because it's an extraordinary convergence of days. So thanks so much, and. Slow regards to all. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. So uh, this recording will be posted on our website early next week, coming out in the leader links that'll be out uh, end of next week. So if there, anyone uh, you know wanted to be here who couldn't, you can share it that way. Um, and now, quickly, I'm going to unmute all of us. And uh, if you can just say where you're calling from and a quick goodbye.
All right. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, it didn't work. Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye from Goodbye. Sonoma County. <laughs> Bye Thank from you so Chicago. Much. Bye. <laughs> Sorry for those rumors. Goodbye from Blue Ridge, Georgia. <laughs> oh. oh. <Yeah>. All right. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.